Hi, I'm Zoe. And I'm Emily. And I'm Sam. And welcome to today's segment of Let's, Let's Get Tangy, Tangy With It. it. In today's segment of Let's Get Tongi With It, the three of us will be discussing how the three main religions in the Tong Dynasty are kind of used as a way of female empowerment for women. Today we'll just really be comparing and contrasting three religions um, that were most prominent in the Tong Dynasty, which are Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. And we'll be just comparing their levels of empowerment for women in ways that they affected their place in society, their roles in family, etc. So the time period of our podcast is the Tong Dynasty because in the Tong Dynasty there was a very prominent practice of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism and we really wanted to dive into why these three major religions were important and practiced by women even though some of them were very empowering and some were very um, repressive repressive to women. But still, in some extents, we all found that uh, the, between Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, they still provided a level of women empowerment that weren't present before. So that differentiation between the Tang Dynasty and other imperial dynasties in China is really what just makes our argument present um, because uh, they were the most popularized religions during this time, and we do see like significant social change um, in women and family structures, governments, uh, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk to you about that today. Mm -hmm. So kind of to give a little bit of background information on the Tang Dynasty, we have to kind of set the stage for women and know that the Tang Dynasty was the one era in Imperial China that allowed for more social mobility for women and more freedom. And a lot of the ways that they went about getting this was through various religions and philosophies that they practiced, which is the main things that we'll be talking about today. In Imperial China, women are generally placed at the bottom of the social structure. China used and still continues to use the feudal system in some aspects today. Um, they Women are typically there to serve their families. They're always at the bottom of whatever social structure they're in, doesn't matter how it is, government, family, whatever. And it doesn't really matter for like class differences. Uh, rural women in Imperial China were always there to serve their husbands and their husbands' families. Uh, they would have to leave their own, so generally they would always just be submitting to men in some sort of way there. And then even in higher uh, social classes, uh, they would usually take on the role as concubines or wives, which still didn't get a lot of say. Um, and anything really, even um, concubines that worked for the emperor, though they would have some level of responsibility, uh, they would always be submitting to another woman, and then um, from that other woman, they'd be submitting to man, so. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show! All right, so now that y'all know our topic and argument for today, uh, we're just going to go ahead and get into it. But first, a fun Imperial China fact with Sam. Thanks for that introduction, Zoe. So for my fun fact, I want to kind of talk about how women and Taoism were perceived. And one of those things is that they were seen as possessors of supernatural connections, healing powers, and shamanic techniques, which led to the emergence of powerful priests, founders, and matriarchs. So I just thought that was really interesting and I wanted to share that little fun fact. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show! Okay, so to get things started, we're going to talk about Confucianism, and the big question for me when I was doing my research was, um, why would a woman enter into a religion slash philosophy that would repress her and make her feel lesser than? So, um, in a way, I was concerned that it wouldn't be possible to argue that for Confucianism. Yeah, especially because like in Buddhism and Taoism, you definitely see like yes. more, uh, <laughs> more results in social change and you know, it just seems more appealing, uh, but sorry, continue. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Um, so Confucianism clearly has been long credited with the suppression of women. Um, it can be argued that the foundation of the social repression 
um, in Chinese society is found in this religion. Um, Didn't the feudal system also come from Confucianism too? It did. Um, the three obediences, which were um, a woman was expected to be obedient to their fathers from birth, <laughs> and then their husbands once they were married, and then their children um, after their husbands died or they were widowed, um, was a Confucius teaching. Um, so uh, go ahead, tell us why you think then that it was in some way like an empowerment for women in the Tang Dynasty, because uh, so far it doesn't sound that great, <laughs> but there is a point to this. So um, according to one of my sources, which was Feminist Encounters with Confucius, um, he was really actually not that unappreciative of women, at least from what I've gathered. Um, so Confucius found um, women to be of the utmost respect, um, mainly due to their wisdom. For example, um, he taught his teach his students, his teachers, <laughs> his <laughs> students, that he admired this woman named Lady Jinjang. Jinjang? I wouldn't be able to tell you unless I saw it. <laughs> um, she's the mother of Prime Minister Winbo. Can you see it? Jin Jing Ooh, hello. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm better um, with Korean right. pronunciation. <laughs> mainly because she didn't. In uh, mainly because quote she did not indulge in extravagance. Um, he praised her for knowing ritual and expressing affection without bias and handling affairs with proper order. Um, another quote was that he regarded a young girl as that she understands human feelings and proper ritual. Um, so. In early Confucianism, it seems that women were appreciated for their intelligence and their wisdom more than their ability to maintain a home or, like, complete a task. Which, like, usually goes against, like, what the feudal system stands for, which is, like, right. you know, building like, a home, you know, for being, your family and stuff. Being, like, being the person that cooks, keeps the house up, like, takes care of the children. So right. it's interesting that, like, in contrast, he, like, really believes that, like, the wisdom and, like, the brain mm -hmm. of a woman is, like, uh, more important in that aspect. Yeah, so, like, later in um, his Analects, um, it's number 38, um, Confucius states that in teaching, there should be no distinction of classes. So even though women are in that lower category of class, like, he even groups them together with servants, um, <laughs> that they should still be educated people. Um, who are capable of having an intellectual conversation, which I thought was really interesting because um, he's requiring, he, he puts them in this really low category, but yet really promotes that all of China is educated. Right. Mm -hmm. And that he expects, like, the same of them. So it, like, kind of places, like, an equality of, like, men and women there when he's saying like yes. all of China should be educated so so should men and women right. like equally and, and yet it, he only taught men yeah and like, <laughs> like how you explain it to it kind of sounds a little backhanded like you said like they're put in the same category as servants mm -hmm. but yes let's educate them too right so that's kind of that to me that's a little backhanded it is but and, I mean like we're not saying here that Confucianism wasn't repressive to women like, right this is just um, the positives of, <laughs> yes. of um, Confucianism. I think that um, it could be really hard to live up to these expectations, to be able to be um, very ritual mm -hmm. for a woman. And so in a way that can cause some stress and strain on the female um, Chinese. Yeah. The but, like, in also in the uh, <laughs> filial piety, like, just that system and stuff like that, like, um, like, women having, like, a role for themselves, doesn't that, like, also, like, give women a level of empowerment? Yeah, it does. Um, I talked about this aspect that um, Ranju her, her uh, she focuses on the mothering aspect of Confucianism, um, so the way that mothers interpret his teachings um, kind of translates into the strict motherhood. Like in the West, we would talk about it, and um, in some cases it would be like a helicopter parent, or but they call it a tiger mother. 
Um, they are historically very good at being mothers to successful, well-educated children, but in this system, they kind of miss out on the opportunity to like express themselves because Confucian teaches that you're supposed to be um, there for the betterment of your children and your family. And so anything that you ascri ascribe or aspire yeah. to be, uh -huh. <laughs> um, wow, couldn't get that word, um, aspire to be kind of goes on the back burner. So for like modern feminists, <laughs> um, Confucianism would seem very repressive. Yeah, but of course, like in the Tang Dynasty, like they didn't have like these views of modern feminism. Right. So like comparatively to other imperial eras, like this idea is still like a lot better than what they had before. Right. Um, and I imagine that for some women in the Tang Dynasty, it was really nice to know that like you have a role and it's your job to do that. Um, unlike today, <laughs> we um, worry about our jobs or like where we're gonna go. Mm -hmm. They know that their job is to get married and have children and be that tiger mother right. for those kids. And, and like yeah. when I think about it with what I know about like modern feminism is that like you said, like we're concerned with our careers and everything mm -hmm. like that. And we don't often associate feminism or like our modern idea of feminism, especially in the West, with a woman can find empowerment in being a mother too. Yeah, being right. A wife. Because like our views of feminism are completely different than like Chinese mm -hmm. um, right. like views, especially like in this time period. And I I I would honestly tie that back to like how Confucius said like it's a woman's responsibility to also have like the same level of intelligence as a man. You know, because I think there he's really trying to articulate that women with their roles of like creating strong men, like they are like I see that kind of as like being the backbone of like a strong society, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. because like uh, he talks about like how important it is to be educated. Well, who's going to educate those boys? It's, it's your mom, you know? Yeah, like, I see like on like lo searching through Pinterest, like some of these dumb, like dumb quotes like that. That was in air quotes um, <laughs> that where it's behind every like king, there's a queen. So, like, mm -hmm. there's always, like, a stronger, like, a strong woman, strong representation of a woman behind a strong man. Yeah. yeah. So, even though, like, she is at the bottom, mm -hmm. I don't see that really as him saying that it's the bottom. I think that she's the base, like, the structure. Foundation. The foundation, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, with the emergence of Confucianism, like, she really, I think from the feudal, like, era um, perspective to, like, Confucian perspective, she really isn't, like, so unimportant. Like, she has importance. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, you have to interpret it that way, yeah, the right. way that he sees it, that women have wisdom and they're capable of education and building up China. Right. Uh, yeah. And in the Tang Dynasty, that's, prob that's the way they pictured it. Mm -hmm. um, so some of my argument for why Confucianism is repressive for women um, they Confucian actually doesn't really write about women. He's really focused on like what men should do. Um, but in Analects 24 and 25, he's talking to one of his students, or um, yeah, I believe it's one of his students. And his student says, um, I hate those who pry out matters and ascribe to knowledge to the knowledge of their wisdom. I hate those who are not only who are only not modest and think that they are valorous. I hate those who make known secrets and think they are straightforward. Um, Confucius responds by saying, of all people, girls and servants are the most difficult to behave to. If you are familiar with them, they lose their humility. If you maintain a reserve towards them, they are discontented. Um, in this quote, he's teaching that the lowest level of society is the least trustworthy and the most difficult to be around and that they kind of have to be like put in line. Um, so I can see how that would very, be very much, repressive. Yeah, be very rep repressive towards women in this time period. Because, like, from my interpretation of that, it sounds like he's like servants and women are very much second class citizens to them, mm -hmm. just because they're uniquely, apparently, designed to misbehave. Yeah, um, they're not capable of being anything else. <laughs> 
Well, that's how you could probably see that Confucianism is a little more repressive than Buddhism and Taoism, but that's why we kind of just wanted to start it um, for the beginning of our conversation, because like we said before, there are different levels of empowerment between these three religions, but they are still there and they do make a difference in Chinese society during the Tang Dynasty. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on from Confucianism, probably come back to it in our conclusion. But let's see, stop real fast for a quick commercial break. Oh, man. Ah, Sam, what's troubling you? It's these darn bound feet. Normally I'd be a size 10, but these three-inch shoes are killing me. I know, right? It's so hard to get around the house and, like, get chores done when your feet hurt so bad. Cooking and cleaning is such a hassle. Whoa, guys, I, I know an answer to your problem. Unbinding our feet? No, that's ridiculous. Who needs to do that nowadays when there's Doll Shoes Warehouse? Doll Shoes Warehouse? Yeah, they make special insoles for Lotus Shoes from sizes two and a half inches to three and a half inches with a crazy expansive selection. That way you won't ever have to unbind your feet and you can get around doing your daily chores all the time with no complaints to men about how much your feet hurt. That's so wonderful. This is life changing. I know, and you can get it for just 20 small payments of $19.95 plus shipping and handling. And when you order now, we'll give you an even smaller pair of shoes than the ones you already have before. Because who wants big, fat, clunky feet? Here's the show with one episode. So we use them and Emily. Welcome to the family. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. All right, so coming off of Confucianism, which out of our three religions um, of the Tang Dynasty that we decided was a little bit more repressive to women, we're going to talk about the one that is arguably most um, empowering to women, which is Buddhism. So Buddhism, um, interestingly enough, um, during the Tang Dynasty out of Taoism and Confucianism, at first was not very popular. Um, and one way that we really see its emergence is actually through women. So that's how it really starts um, its popularization in the Tang Dynasty. Um, and it actually has to do with the first and only emperor of China, Imperial China that was a woman who was Wu Zetian. Um, and even though before her reign, Taoism and Confucianism were the um, most popular and most prioritized religions in the Tang Dynasty. She popularized Buddhism herself while using it to bring herself to a higher status, which was, as I stated before, the only emperor who was a woman in all of Imperial China. So um, basically, before her reign, uh, like I said, uh, the rulers before her really embraced Taoism mostly, um, but um, she used it to advance herself politically. So she used it as her stance and she really um, put herself into uh, devoting herself to da um, Buddhism in China. She built temples, she um, uh, supported monks, um, translation of the sutras, uh, monasteries were built, uh, she ordained thousands of monks, and because of this, um, she got a lot of petitions just about two months after she started this campaign, requesting her to become the, um, the emperor by not just monks, but um, commoners, foreigners, uh, representing officials, like tons of people that were just in support of everything she was doing. So basically because she was endorsing this religion very much so, they were just like, yeah, let's make her emperor well they saw like all the great things that she was doing with it mm -hmm. um and so they were hoping that in her reign that she would continue to do this yeah essentially um and they just got a lot of um basically like assurance from her because she was able to do so much like before she was even um emperor um they saw her as like someone that could get stuff done um so she really used buddhism to advance herself through the ranks which is one like super important way if not like one of the most important ways 
that um, Buddhism brought empowerment to women in the Tang Dynasty, which was through Wu Zetan. Um, and she actually uh, decided not to immediately advance as emperor. She uh, still used the mandate of heaven, but um, she pulled Buddhism into the mandate of heaven um, to advance about half a la year later. So after she became emperor, um, shortly after, Buddhism is actually ranked um, in priority above Taoism. Uh, so that's a really big advancement for both Buddhism and Wu Zetan as a woman in Tang Dynasty China. So um, a couple more advancements um, that once Buddhism was popularized um, in the Tang Dynasty and able to create advancements for women, uh, there were several ways in which uh, when you analyze the actual scriptures of Buddha, you can see where women empowerment would be something that it could embody and why women might be excited about embracing Buddhism. Um, for one thing, the middle path is just an idea that articulates that one should not stray to any extremes. Uh, one thing that it really focuses on is sex and how that people should not um, really be doing anything too sexually basically too sexually aggressive. Uh, for Buddhists, sex is about love. It's about um, creating a relationship, um, a connection really, um, where before in imperialist China, sex and women like really aren't associated with those ideals. So when it comes to something that's so important um, to the relation of women, which is sex, which usually when we think about women being repressed by sex, it's just for, you know, reproduction. Um, and, you know, like we've talked about before in our, in our women's Chinese history class lecture that uh, concubines and other women were just kind of used for sex um, at disposal. It's a really important... Uh, um, it's a very important milestone for women. Uh, and so, yeah. Also, in class, like, we discussed that women, we don't really know much about women's sexuality in Chinese history because whatever we know about it, air quotes, is from men, the men's perspective more so yes. than it would be from the women's perspective, too. Yes. So just the fact that they, in the Eightfold Path, um, he articulates ex like explicitly that you should avoid unlawful sexual intercourse. So just anything like uh, cheating on your wife, abusing her sexually, uh, that's really what that kind of falls into. It's um, one thing that like women could definitely support and gain some empowerment from in the Tang Dynasty. So in Buddhism, it kind of holds up um, that men also have a standard that's yes like sexually... men have a responsibility also it's not it's both genders um but of course you know we tend to correlate men with being you know the violent um source of sex right. um usually but it does give men a responsibility to treat women with respect when it comes to sex and that's something that's very groundbreaking i feel like with this religion um another thing uh, that I found very interesting was when I was looking up uh, deities uh, in relation to Buddhism. They, uh, Buddhism, to some extent, quote, accepts the development of female deities. So there's one deity, uh, her name is Guanyin, and in the Tang Dynasty of China, she actually is given the identity of female due to uh, her characteristics she's supposed to be a goddess of forgiveness and mercy uh so she is uh, established to be female in the tong dynasty but uh the progress that she makes for a woman um is very substantial so her background story is she's her origin is found from a previous goddess in taoism who represents power because she strayed from the path of marriage and just went off to focus on religion and abstinence. So uh, since that was her origin, she really takes the essence of Buddhism that has to do with like sex and empowerment and turns it into something that eventually did become 
uh, a more acceptable standard for women when they were before in China just kind of accepted to go off and join a family um, and work for their husbands and his family and, you know, become married. It was actually, um, you know, becoming somewhat more acceptable for a woman to just practice abstinence if they chose to and focus on religion. And it became like a, quote, a legitimate alternative to conventional marital marital obedience in so imperial rather than China. like having to jump straight into a marriage she could she had like more of the freedom to choose well uh another source that i looked over was very interesting in the fact that uh women they took several stances on buddhism but one was that in the tang dynasty um they could leave their home um becoming book Sunnis um, and basically those were just women that went off to find enlightenment instead of just um, conforming to marriage and um, though it wasn't like the most common um, choice for Buddhist women it was uh, actually a legitimate option for once in Chinese society so um, it wasn't no longer like a mainstream belief that a woman had to go off and get married so uh, that was something that was a very empowering for women because it kind of gave them a new role in Chinese society. That kind of reminds me of one of the points that I'm going to make in my discussion about Taoism for women not having to jump straight into marriage or where they have the ability to leave Yeah, what they're traditionally Definitely. Taught. And, <laughs> like, women that did choose marriage, like, um, and they were Buddhists, like, they could still gain empowerment from it because during this time, like I said, Buddhism was gaining traction, like it was gaining popularity and through a woman like um, doing so, like she was the origin of that. And in society, like uh, this source uh, that I reviewed women in Chinese history, quote, um, there, uh, it was very, sorry, <laughs> Buddhism was attractive to women, quote, because it created a vision that they longed for, um, pause quote or stop quote <laughs> because um, they finally were able to be influencers. Women would be the ones that would um, learn about Buddhism in society and when she could um, bring these beliefs forward to her family and to her neighbors, um, these beliefs that like uh, showed restraint and enlightenment and spiritual power um, she would he would say gain respect from other people so in turn um she no longer just had to like gain like her personal achievements from building a strong family or you know having it come from her husband or any other male figure she could build it herself with the empowerment of buddhism she could gain quote bliss renown and profit just by following like its essences its teachings uh stuff like that so that's how it really all ties in together and i see that as like why it is one of the more empowering religions in the tang dynasty for women because it changed things all the way from the high up government aspect of Wu Zetan all the way down to the rural woman like just living in trying to raise her family you know it it could affect anyone for any lifestyle they chose whether it would be to go off and just practice enlightenment and abstinence and not have a family or if she did need to or wanted to have a family she could still find a level of empowerment or if she's the emperor you know she could still do that so I think it's the best part about it is it's very versatile to all classes and types of women in China y'all yeah. have any other notes I, on that I think that's really interesting because like we haven't even talked about Taoism yet but already like <clears throat> from what I know about Taoism and what I've researched I can tell that between the three, like, it, you're definitely right. Buddhism is definitely the most, like, liberating and empowering for women. So. Yeah, because the more I listen to you, I'm like, I thought, you know. Confucianism is <laughs> not good. Was, <laughs> Confucianism has its, has its I was you know, downsides. I was finding the positives in Confucianism and trying to see how women would want to be there. But I kind of, like, I like that Buddhism has all these options like mm -hmm. I can see why in the Tang Dynasty that would be a very popular religion very or enticing yeah definitely I find it versatile and like they say like 
one thing that um, allowed for this spread of Buddhism around women is just like social like um, mainstream trends is what women Chinese uh, women's history in China like describes it as and that just kind of reminds me today of how like women talk to each other like gossip kind of like communicate right. and like make their own trends and stuff in society but this one is like so like groundbreaking for their empowerment and you know it's not just like gossiping it's like something like that sharing beliefs actually give them like power and respect in their family or like liberation to go live off by themselves right. um, and just be like not married for their entire lives if they choose that. And if they do choose stuff like that, you know, they get the empowerment from Buddhism, like the, the enlightenment that they're searching for. They, you know, feel achieved in themselves. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So... Um, mm-hmm. Definitely. That's why I feel like yeah. Buddhism made, like, a lot of strides in the Tang Dynasty, like, for women empowerment. I liked that you talked about um, the liberatingness of, like, being in control of sex. Like, all of that. Because a lot of women in Confucianism didn't feel that way. Like, their job was to get married and have children. Yeah. Reproduce. Um, That's was to reproduce. the only thing. Um, and the idea that, like, there's something deeper out there for women is like really attractive Definitely. and empowering. And I think that's something that we see across like almost every culture, like their history and like ancient times, imperial times, whatever it is for them, is that women's only thing is that they're there for reproduction while men get the sexual gratification and satisfaction. Like they're the, it's for them to feel good, but women don't matter. Right. So that's something that. It, it kind of, like, stresses for an equality, really, like, a mm-hmm. gender equality, mm-hmm. just by, like, saying, like, something as simple as the the Eightfold Path saying one should avoid unlawful sexual intercourse. Like, it's it's just a couple words, but, like, it means so much more, like, oh, yeah. to the woman. Um, because, like we, like, we pointed out before, like, in Confucianism, like, women don't even have that. Mm-hmm. And, like, something is, like, simple as, like, being able to, like enjoy loving sex and you know form connections from it Mm -hmm. and you know just get more out of it than something that's like violent or spiteful or like just for reproductive purposes like brings a whole new meaning to like sexual relationships Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and just to make it clear um that's not to say that confucianism didn't allow for love no definitely not (laughs) yes (laughs) We're not condoning that Confucianism makes unhappy marriages. Yes, yeah. Because yeah. that, like, we've discussed this in class, too. Like, that's not the case for every marriage that, like, arra- especially, no. like, arranged marriages. Like, they were they were yeah. not all loveless marriages. Right. But definitely there's, you know, more opportunity. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Coming up, another fun fact. And then we're going to discuss, discuss Taoism. And now for a quick fun fact with Zoe. All right, thank you, Emily. Fun fact today actually has to do with Wu Zetian. So, her um, son of Emperor Wu Zetian, Xiao Sha, um, who ruled as emperor from 555 AD to 562, um, quote, detested women. Despite having filial love for his mother and great respect for her, he actually did not like women at all. In fact, If he came into contact with them during sexual relations, he would discard of any clothes that touched their skin and often would note on the stench of women that passed by him, even if they didn't probably smell that bad. Was he actually gay? And this is just a cover-up for his sexuality? Scholars don't know, but that's up to you to decide. And thank you for this fun fact with Zoe. I was a victim. I thought being skinny was in, but you could see my ribs, and apparently that's a bad thing. Have you or a loved one suffered as a cause of the Great Chinese Famine between the years 1959 and 1961? You may be entitled to compensation. Call 555-555-8555 to speak to one of our representatives today to see if you qualify for legal compensation. Again, that is 
I may not have my family, but at least I can't see my ribs anymore. Again, call 555-555-8555 for compensation. Don't end up a victim like me. There's the show with an episode. So he's there and Emily. In the Taoist religion, women were able to assume roles of religious leaders, mentors, priestesses, theorists, adepts, and ritualists, or as poets and artists, which occasionally had some pull in governmental affairs, which is actually really big for women during this time. Um, a majority of women were young women when, when they became priestesses, and those who were not are classified as having fulfilled their domestic duties by then. A few of the women who joined in this followed the teachings of their parents and became priestesses. And in my research, what I found was that older women who had already fulfilled their duties, they had children, they were married, and they did, fulfilled their Confucian duties, and then they, find, they found that Taoism was kind of, I guess, more for them, in my understanding. For like an older generation kind of thing, or? I think it's like what it is is that they were like okay I did what I was supposed to do by having children by being a mother and now it's time for me to move on like one of the in one of my sources there is a I think her name was Lady, yeah, Lady Lee um, she was from an elite family and became a priestess when she was middle aged to older so after she uh, fulfilled her Confucian fam familial duties as wife and mother mm -hmm. and she went like she kind of criticized the ritual of, be of burying the deceased husband and wife in the same tomb so as a way from my understanding it was a way of her taking her new identity as an ordained priestess and that was more significant to her than the traditional values of Confucianism so even <clears throat> though like Confucianism like uh other philosophies and religions in this time, like the three we're talking about, can be used like together. She placed a little bit more importance in the one you think that gave her a little more empowerment, you'd say? Mm -hmm. I have that written in my notes where it's, so in a way she found more freedom and liberation in her ability to be independent as female, an independent female as a priestess than as a wife in her role as pr practicing a Confucian philosophy as she had done for most of her life. So that's like a really big thing for women stepping away from Confucian ideals in the feudal system and going in and taking, being able to find more power and freedom. Because during this time, like during the Tang Dynasty, priestesses preaching in public was not uncommon too. And like that was like a big thing for women to be able to speak out in front of like crowds of people instead of just groups of small groups of women too. So, there's that. So, um, like, just an example of, like, women spreading influence to not just women, but, you know, both, yeah. se both genders in China. Yeah. So that's pretty, I feel like, groundbreaking. It me. really is. Um, and I have a quote here from Jin Hua Jia uh, from the religious and other experiences of Tao priestesses in Tang, China. We know of some 28 princesses and many other royal and palace women who were ordained as Taoist priestesses. To a certain degree, ordained royal women establish a role model for other potential or actual priestesses. Throughout the Tang era, numerous women from both elite and commoner families became ordained Taoist priestesses, and many covents were built, or convents were built. So that just, it gave them more power to be able to branch out of like what was traditionally in their society like gave them more social mobility also i think that's interesting because um i don't know if we really discussed it with buddhism but you know with like the exam system like they talk about how people are allowed to advance socially through that and like how i kind of talked about in buddhism where like it's very like adaptable to whatever class system you're in so i think that's one kind of common denominator that we all like hold between like Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. it, it like doesn't have so much to do with like your class all the time that um, they can like adapt to wherever you are in society, which is 
which is pretty good, I feel like, mm-hmm. for, like, availability. I mean, it really is. Um, another, some of, like, my evidence to go along with, like, women being able to step outside of their traditional roles is actually from a female deity, which is the highest female de- deity in the Taoist religion. It, uh, she, Wang Mu, um, she's also known as the Queen Mother of the West. Both men and women worshipped her. So it's not just, like, one side where, like, we're, it's not just where women were doing it. She acted as a patron deity for all women in Taoism. She is a special guardian of singing girls, dead women, novices, nuns, adepts, and priestesses, which are roles that stand out from the traditional roles of imperial China, the dutiful wife, obedient, uh, the dutiful daughter, obedient wife, and the self-sacrificing mother. Um <clears throat> Interesting. So it's kind of like a safe haven in a way. For yeah. Um, I, think, I think I remember like reading that my like deity Guan Yin is like uh, kind of comes from the Queen of the West you said like she gets some of her imagery from that. So um, it was like talking about like when she was <laughs> developing like her image as a female like she she did come from Taoism. So mm-hmm. that's interesting how those two connect there. Yeah. yeah. And like her sim like her symbols like the seal is a whip a seal and a sword which I think is kind of interesting for that to be associated with a woman because when you think of swords or whips like you think men and war and this is to this woman who's there for like nuns and priestesses and that's like something completely I think what I don't know I don't know what the word is but it 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 contradicts itself kind of if you think about it well, I think about like imperial images that we've seen, things that show women in like a dainty and submissive mm-hmm. way. I mean, even the pornography we had to look at in <laughs> class was um, very representative of this gentle woman. So I think it's very interesting to see them in a different light or and represented <laughs> in a different light. Yeah, and there's like how she's depicted is um so she is considered to be the ultimate yin and it's from the life-giving peach which represents and this this is coming from my source it's saying the life-giving peach which represents the good of the yin the breast the vulva and the baby's round bottom and then it's the positive attribute to which represents the good and nurturing mother. So that's one aspect where going back on the Confucianism is like mm-hmm. some women find empowerment and being a mother and be, fulfilling that role of a mother and a wife. And then it goes into the life-taking tiger, which is her vehicle or her alter ego. And one aspect of her is that she has a leopard's tail and tiger's teeth. And that's how people like identify her in a way and this represents the negative of the yin in which she's a dangerous mother um so i think that that's very interesting so um there are also jade girls which is the equivalent the chinese equivalent to indian asperas and it quote, glorifying the deity in which, in whose entourage they appear and performing supporting roles in the rituals, end quote. And so, like, that's, like, them kind of taking, being able to take part in rituals, which is, like, a really important thing, because, like, when you think back again, like, when you think about traditional roles, like, it's men doing everything. You don't think that women have any freedom to join in and be a part of that, and for this, the Jade Girls possess, like, they're celestial musicians. Uh, they're Jade Girls who possess the arts of the bedchamber and of war. <laughs> Whoa. So if you, if you want to be so specific about that, the bedchamber, I think that's... Mm, <laughs> the bedchamber yeah, and of sex war. Sex workers, prostitutes. Right. They... Uh, Quote, they can instruct the worthy adept with their beauty, talents, and service. The Jade Girls provide one role model for medieval Chinese women. So that's a little bit of a kind of like taking power for themselves. Like they can choose what they want to do and they can choose how they go about doing this. Um, Jade Girls and the, like, they set an example of submission and skillful service. 
service for prostitutes and performers while the queen mother sets an example of attainment and power for Taoist priestesses and adepts and these both stood outside the women outside women's normal roles in the household which is again to be a daughter like a dutiful daughter the mother a wife submitting to the men the confucian ideals oh yeah the feudal Mm -hmm. yeah um goddesses are often male fantasies which are like sexual or maternal like and like while she is like the queen mother is kind of maternal like made a mother it's she embodies the model of a woman as dynamic and creative independent forces and she's represented the essential importance of the yin side of humanity which is a really big deal for like a woman to be kind of idolized in this she can empower women they can kind of like take things for themselves and go about whatever they want to like in reference to the yin side like uh, it's supposed to be like the dark the wet like the things that like you don't necessarily associate with being good but it's also female like how do you think like that is like she her representing like the perfect yin like brings more empowerment because like you often don't associate it with like it being like something necessarily good you know i think it goes back to how it she's depicted as like the perfect balance between the like the mother and a little bit of the danger too like it said like the life taking tiger and the life giving peach like those two terms were very like big in my source that that was this is what this is so like in the yin and yang symbols like they have a little bit of each other in them and so that's kind of like how they where they balance each other out so like there's always i get in i guess in a way to kind of how i guess simplize it is like mm-hmm. there's always light in the dark and there's always dark in the light if that makes and any sense and she's like the perfect representation of that basically mm-hmm. as a woman that's kind of interesting because like when i talked about buddhism i said like that they really focus on like the middle path like Mm -hmm. just being like having that perfect balance like not going on to both extremes and like that like in some ways like sexually brought like liberation and empowerment to like women Mm -hmm. um through that so like you can also see that mirrored in taoism when you have like that perfect balance and like that representative female figure she's empowering women like through her representation of doing so Mm -hmm. yeah and it's like again like that the life taking or the life giving peach and the life taking tiger like that shows like two different sides of to me like from my interpretation of it it shows two different sides of like the empowerment it was like where you can be the mother and you can be the wife and that in itself can be empowering like we talked about in confucianism or you can step away from that and not follow that and just be something completely different and just be like you're kind of your own person and, and yet still be empowered and still be empowered through that way because you have that self-empowerment and that independence and freedom awesome that's really awesome yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> all right um just out of i guess curiosity because at the beginning we were talking about how Taoism happened towards the end of her life am i talking about the same person I'm not sure. Um, we were talking about how they can women completed oh. their Confucian <clears throat> ideals yeah. or their expected roles, yeah. and then turned to Taoism for like a new form of like liberation. Right. I was one. I was just sitting here thinking that um, I wonder, like, I guess what that woman thought of as she was doing it. Like, as she was switching from this Confucian world to, hey, here's my empowerment. Like, do you think she was still, she still felt empowered throughout all of that? If that makes any sense. I think in a way, yeah, because um, she, like, her husband died before her. Mm -hmm. And, like, she, like, she had sons. And in the source, it said that she told her sons that she did not want to be buried with her husband Mm -hmm. because, like, that takes away from the purity within Taoism, from the Tao. And that, I think, like, she's had, from the Confucian standpoint, maybe she felt empowered because, like, she was a mother, she was a wife, Mm -hmm. and she did have that time where she, like, I guess she was happy with it. And then later on, as, like when her sons are adults and like her husband's dead and it's just like well my husband's dead I can't be a wife anymore right 
I can just be a mother and maybe she kind of found in a way is like maybe now because my one of my duties is over mm -hmm. and because I have raised my son maybe I can go and do this so it just kind of shows that like for that empowerment she was in search of like a new role to fulfill mm -hmm. and like she was going to gain that power when she achieved that new role and she had the motivation to go out and do it like she wasn't content with just you know one so yeah, I right. think that like adding Taoism to your Confucian ideals like is definitely a way that they can work together mm -hmm. to like help empowerment also it's not just like you have to have one or the other um, and only believe that like this one will bring me empowerment or the other will or won't you know like they yeah. complement each other yeah right because I was thinking about those three obediences like for women and how they have to be obedient to their husband and then their or their fathers and their husbands and then their children mm -hmm. and how as you were explaining she just didn't she was obedient to her children I guess in a in a way yeah but like not in the way that a Confucian yeah would or even like just a a feudal system woman would at this time yeah and like even for like young women going into it there I like remember looking on the table that there were women or young girls as I think as young as 12 mm -hmm. who were like not even entering into a marriage and they were going straight into being a priestess or like training to be a priestess and whatever and like some of them like they did this on their own and most of these were from like I think most of them were, were from elite families but there were cases from commoner families and then some of them they were like their fathers kind of pushed them to go into doubt like going into a priestess, priestess hmm. yeah interesting i think it really kind of shows how all of these are Taoism, buddhism and confucianism are all religions that women adopted but like mm -hmm. how fluid they are in a way like, no, they're definitely, like, interconnected, I feel like. And that's mm -hmm. that's one, like, reason I feel like they all did so well in the Tang Dynasty. Because, mm -hmm. like, one didn't, like, necessarily kill the other. Sure, at, like, some points, like, some were more popular than others. But, like... And we even discussed in class, or, or at least I think we even discussed in class, that all three of these religions are still present today. And, like, they all, like, people don't just adopt one religion. Like, mm -hmm. They adopt, like, several practices from different religions, which I think we see even with Lady Lee because she went from Confucianism to Taoism. And they, like, coexist together. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just thinking about how in the West, like, you know, you adopt only one religion. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, it's just interesting to think that you could adopt multiple and it be a religion but also a philosophy yeah or is that what it is a yeah. philosophy yeah. And like, <laughs> like all three of our relig like all three of our religions are also considered philosophies too yeah so it's just really interesting to see the how they intertwine together and how they're also so different mm -hmm. so. they all have their uh you know positive attributes they have some downsides <laughs> but overall <laughs> some they, more than others yeah <laughs> overall they work together pretty well and I feel like that's probably why like with their emergence like mm -hmm. in prioritization in society like they did so well for women empowerment in the Tang dynasty yeah that's so true definitely and like as a sum for all three of them I think it's safe to say that the most liberating was probably Buddhism probably and then yeah. Taoism Buddhism doesn't mean to flex but. and then Confucianism <laughs> is down there hey I was impressed like with Confucianism I was really concerned that I wasn't going to find anything empowering yeah. for women um but I think I found some some good reasons on why some women would be practicing Confucianism yeah um, and like again like like tying in like modern feminism and thinking about it from the perspective that women should be driven for their careers and whatever yeah. is like that's not necessarily accurate in some cases like in both Taoism and Confucianism where they like familial like familiar familial duties are important right like those are the things that are going to bring you your empowerment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not necessarily like going off and you know yeah yeah becoming emperor not all women can be emperors <laughs> obviously just one yeah just, just one <laughs> Wu Zetan our girl <laughs> all right well do y'all want to go ahead and cut to a commercial break really fast and then conclude
I yeah. think that's a good idea. All right. Well, thank you. That's wrapping up Taoism with Sam. There's the show with one episode. So we stay in Emily. Five, five, five. Five, five. We gotta make it through this. Family. <laughs> and we're back with Taoism with Sam, and I'm Sam. I just introduced myself because nobody else would do it. I'll introduce you. <laughs> it's too said, late now. Right. Okay, just go ahead and start talking about it, you know? <laughs> this is, um, and we're back with Taoism with Sam. And um, here's Sam right now about to talk about Taoism. <laughs> and we're back after that short commercial break with um, Sam. We're going to talk about Taoism now. You have to think about my name. <laughs> no, I didn't have to think about your name. You have to think about, it's with um, Sam. You have to think about my name. All right. Anyways. <laughs> anyway. Taoism. Talk about Taoism yeah. now. So, uh, Taoism is a Chinese philosophy based on the writings of Lao Tzu. Tzu? I'm going to say Tzu because it's T-Z-U. And it actually emerged around the same time as Confucianism. Ooh. So, that's really interesting. We like especially Confucianism. since they're pretty different with the fact that Confucianism is, is pretty repressive. And in comparison to both Taoism and, and Buddhism, Buddhism, so far it has been very repressive. Yeah. <laughs> so Taoism doesn't have a singular god like Abrahamic religions in the West. They, it's one of the religions that allowed for more opportunities for females in Imperial China, specifically within the Tang Dynasty, and. It, when you think of yin and yang, as many people like to pronounce it, yin and yang, um, it that is where that actually. Yep. 